Hi, I'm Bob Seifert, and this is Ariana Noble. Hi. And welcome to episode two of The Missing with Ari and Bob. Today we are covering the disappearance of Emma Filipov. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for watching um, and talk about our mission statement for this channel. Uh, every missing person has a story and a family that misses them. And our mission is to cover uh, the stories of those missing, especially those that don't get much coverage. Uh, there are so many cases on NamUs and other sources that we, we could literally do a case a day and wouldn't scratch the surface. Uh, that's how uh, many people are missing in the US and Canada and worldwide. Also like to thank you for supporting the mission of this channel, by subscribing, sharing, and liking. We kind of have a dual sort of mission. One is we really want to cover these cases, so we're not so much into subscriptions. But on their hand, if no one watches the channel, then no one hears about the case. So uh, if you can support us by subscribing, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, also, if you have a case you want us to cover, please fill out our online form. I will put a link in the uh, show notes. Also, when I go back and edit this, I'll put it up on the screen so you can see it. You can also make this request in the comments if you like, if there's a case that you would like us to cover. Either us produced video, which is the ones where we have Anastasia's awesome art uh, in the background and, and narration, if you want it done that way, or if you just would like me and Ari to talk about it. Tonight, we'll be covering the case of Emma Filipov. I first heard about this case on Brain Scratch Search Live with John Lorden. I don't know if you've any of you have seen that channel. Uh, and when I heard Shelley Filipov talking about Emma on the Fifth Estate, it struck me that behind each disappearance, uh, there are also people who love the missing person and are hurting. And that's kind of indirectly, it was because of Shelley that this channel actually exists. I also have a personal friend who was close to Shelley when they were in high school, so I have a little bit of a personal connection to it indirectly. Um, yeah, every Mother's Day, I think about the fact that uh, another Mother's Day has passed and still no Emma. Um, also, last year I was editing um, an episode about Kayla Lundmahan late in the night on November 28th, and then I suddenly realized that another anniversary had passed. Uh, and Shelly or uh, Emma is still missing. Uh, so it was uh, eight years, um, November of 2020. Uh, I have this quote that I pulled down from Shelly that I was going to read. I'm still hopeful, but it's harder every day, Shelly said. My mental state is shaky, psychologically, emotionally. I'm pretty shaky. Every day I wake up and dread the day. I think, oh God, not another day without her. Somehow I put in the time. I don't volunteer. I don't socialize. I spend much of the time with my dog. He's the sweetest. Honestly, I don't know what I do during the day to get through the day. I'm relieved at the end of the day when I get to go to sleep. Uh, so that's kind of Shelly's world at the moment. Um, actually since Emma went missing. Uh, I think at first it was a little easier for her because she had leads to follow up on. Now, um, eight years on, there's not as many leads. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's been pretty rough on her. So anyway, hopefully someday Emma will show up. Also, if you want to know more low little details about this case, uh, I'm gonna link our first video was actually on Emma. I think that was done in October of 2020, or maybe it was September. It was light towards the end of the year. Um, so that video is up there. It's one of our produced videos with Anastasia's art. Actually, it actually was the first one that we did. So that's out there, and I'll put that link into the show notes also. So, Emma, on a rainy night in November, on November 28, 2012, Emma was standing barefoot across from the Empress Hotel in Victoria, BC. 
So any of you she had met in a library named Dennis Quay uh, actually bumped into her that night. And Emma was acting odd, um, very frightened. And he was really worried about her. So he actually called the police. And the police showed up. When that happened, Dennis left thinking that she was in good hands. So police talked to her for about 45 minutes uh, and let her go. They just had no legal reason to detain her. I guess they did offer her um, services if she needed it, but she said that she didn't. And so she walked off uh, that night on the 28th and um, that was the last time anyone saw her. But uh, on the 5 a.m. on the 29th, um, she was picked up by a man named William, or at least he thinks it was her. She was soaking wet. I guess she was standing outside screaming. Uh, when she got into his car, I guess she had, she calmed down um, and said she was heading to do with friends in Colwood. I, I found this a bit interesting because she seems to be in kind of a rough mental state, but at the same time, she has a plan and she is carrying out her plan. You know, she wanted to go to Colwood. Um, also in Colwood, later on, she had gotten a prepaid visa on the 28th and that visa was used and it was flagged and the police uh, found that it was a homeless man had picked it up uh, on the uh, trail near Colwood. And so it sounds like she got most of the way there if, if she didn't make it all the way. Another sighting that uh, happened on December 5th, uh, it's never been confirmed, but I found it super intriguing. Uh, there was a woman in the Inner Harbor in Victoria who said she met a girl resembling Emma who helped her frame a shot. She also mentioned that this girl was smoking, which is something that uh, Emma did, and Emma told her to repeat the name Emma Philippa five times. So that would have been, you know, about nine days after she supposedly disappeared. I think Shelly didn't think much of it, but I'm wondering at the time how much information was actually out there right at the beginning, end of 2012, and that her details are so specific. I wonder if it was actually a true sighting. So that would put, um, you know, Emma around at least till the fifth. What happened to her after that, no one seems to know. So Emma left her passport, laptop, journals, camera, and borrowed library books in her van. While that stuff was there, the journals are really important to her. She was a very private person. And a lot of people think that she wouldn't have just walked out without taking her journals. Uh, and, and that's how we get all the um, quotes that we have from her from the, the state and in other videos were from things that she wrote both in her laptop. A little more background about what happened. Before that, Emma moved to Victoria in 2011 from Perth. Perth is all the way on the other side of the country, so north of New York, so basically the east coast of Canada. So she came all the way out to the west coast uh, and settled in Victoria on Vancouver Island. She didn't have a job or a place to stay set up when she came out. She would comment later that she thought something amazing was going to happen to her there, which I hate to say kind of did. It just from our viewpoint wasn't something good. She stayed with a childhood friend at first, um, showed some signs uh, of mental illness. And that childhood friend's name was Michaela. Uh, so we go into that and some more in our video, if you want to see that. Uh, she lost her job at one point. Uh, she was working at a diner. She would later become homeless uh, and stay in the Sandy Women's Merriman Shelter. And then she met another Michaela who goes by the name Micah. Um, and she stayed with her until Micah started traveling. Uh, and then she was back kind of on the street again. She lived off and on the Sandy Merriman House Women's Shelter on, on, in a hotel where she was cleaning rooms. So she had a room there. She slept on friends' boats. I guess she was also known to sleep in the woods. 
Uh, she also did have a seasonal job in the Redfish Bluefish restaurant, which is on the dock in the Inner Harbor. Uh, that job ended at the end of October, uh, but because it's seasonal, it's not that she got fired. Um, and her bosses thought that she was going to come back in the spring when it opened again. Of course, she disappeared, so she she never did return to work. I think they opened again in February of 2013, and Emma never showed up uh, to take her position. She also didn't have plans to leave Victoria. She told the friends she was going to head home or to Mexico, to San Juan, or to Japan with her father. She had said that multiple times and and um, multiple places that she was going to go. So, yeah, maybe she went there. Uh, we don't know what happened to her. I guess the first thing uh, I was going to talk to Ari about was about Emma's mental state on that final day. Um, some people that she had started to suffer from schizophrenia. Uh, other people say she was actually being stalked. I know she was afraid of some man that she had worked with when she was up as a sh being a chef in Campbell River. I don't know if that person was stalking her, but something with her, especially in the last week, um, was going on because she, According to the people in the shelter, she had been happy and cheerful in those last couple of weeks. She had become really sort of down and dark and withdrew from friends, quit drinking, um, became less, less and less social uh, up until the time that she disappeared. So I was going to get Ari's comments. Now that Ari looks bored, wait <laughs> to shut up and stop talking. On that section, about what she thought of Emma's mental state. Yeah, um, I I mean, the first thing that pops into my head is just that she was probably going through something, like whether it was starting to show signs of schizophrenia or something like that, or even just dealing with some sort of depression that she like couldn't figure out her way out of, um, like getting lonely and like not being so social anymore. I feel like a lot of people kind of have that, like, oh, this is a sign that there's something, like there has to be some big disease. There has to be some big change that's happened that's like making this person this way when it can be like something, just a small incident that really just like messes with you for a while. And then like going through the motions of that and like cutting out friends, stopping things that you used to do, like that just kind of, from my own experience, like drives you further into that hole. And um, I know like, uh, I think the like being stalked is really interesting because I like from the way that it seems like from an outside perspective, looking at all the reports and things that we've looked at, like that was something that she definitely thought was happening. And that could be like just seeing people on the street that look kind of similar, or it could be that she was actually being stalked by someone, but then it was written off because she was showing these other signs of something like that. And I mean, that would drive me crazy as a person. <laughs> like if you're dealing with something that was stressing you out and then you thought you're being stalked. And when you try to talk to people about it, they're like, oh, like you're just schizophrenic or whatever's going on there. And then um, not having a real support system in place to support you with whatever's going on would be really difficult. Yep. I know whatever happened, she called her mom about a week before she disappeared and asked her mom to come out and pick her up because she was really struggling at that point. And then she would the next morning she would feel better and she would tell mom not to come. So eventually in the morning, the 28th, Shelly said, no, I'm going. And Emma called her on the 27th, said, mom, please come out. And the morning of the 28th, she said, no, I have mom, not today. But Shelly got on anyway at that point. So whatever was going on, it was pretty noticeable, at least from the staff at the Merriman Shelly. And then it, I don't know if you've watched the video, but her last day, she really stuck out to multiple people as really struggling. 
she looked very, very sad and frightened the day that she disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, I know, like, for me, and from talking to people who've dealt with depression and things like that, like, there are days where you're like really struggling, you're really dealing with something, and then you'll wake up the next morning, or you'll watch a movie, you'll do something, and then you're like, oh, I'm all better, this is fine now. So I don't need like whatever support I had already asked for. And like, that's what I hear a lot of like when we're talking about like her calling her mom and saying like, please come and then calling her back and saying like, no, I'm okay. Like that kind of wanting to be the strong person that can handle it all on her own. And uh, sometimes that can work really well and other times it doesn't. And it's just, it's really interesting to me like that she was asking for that help and then like just kept going back and forth about it and I mean more power to Shelly that she was like no I'm just I'm just gonna go like I hear what you're saying but I can also tell that you're dealing with something and I want to be there for you and um like yeah people noticing that Emma was really struggling with something uh is interesting and Like, it makes me wonder, like, if those people that had noticed something was going on with her had been able to tell her, like, hey, I noticed something seems like it's going on with you. And I know that you, like, aren't really talking to people about it right now, but, like, we're here for you. And, like, making that sort of connection and, like, things like that instead of, like, oh, well, she said that she's fine or Like when we're, when you talked about like the police doing a check on her and talking to her for 45 minutes and then just letting her go, it's like, well, what had that conversation go on for 45 minutes? And like all of those questions come up about like, so what was happening that like had her be dealing with that? And then what was happening for other people that they like couldn't make that connection with her, that she couldn't feel that connection to people as a person who like, from what I've seen of her to be a very like loving and open person who cares a lot. Yeah. I think that on that day or upcoming into that day, she didn't seem to want to take help from people. I know a lot of multiple people tried to intervene, including Julian, who we'll talk about in a bit. Um, He comes up to be both, you know, trying to help her and a suspect. He asked her if she needed help and she told him no. She was also, she had kind of another side to her. There was a really caring side. There was also, she was spiritually independent. Um, So I think those two things were kind of always at a battle, you know, in battling inside of her. Wanted to be, you know, independent and on her own. Mm -hmm. So that contributed. I know, you know, like Dennis called the police. So people, I mean, it was two people actually called the police. There was another person called police during the day saying he saw her and was really worried. So obviously whatever she was doing, she was definitely under st- some sort of stress. It just, no one could really get to her. And I, I think the police don't have, you know, it's not illegal to stand across from the Empress hotel in the rain without your shoes. If she was doing something legal, they could have brought her in, which may have, she may have not gone missing, but they had no no legal mechanism to charge her. And they don't have any, you know, you can't just detain somebody, at least not in the US and Canada, without some sort of cause. So they didn't really, yeah, they didn't really have a mechanism to bring her in, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think about too, like with the police and everything, like there's either like you have friends and family to support you or somebody can call the police to do like a a wellness check on you. But I feel like there should be some sort of in-between ground where it's like, I'm concerned about this person's mental health, but they haven't committed a crime. I just want them to talk to someone or to like be able to be checked in on by someone who has that training to get through to them and like have a conversation like that. Because I feel like the police are so focused on like, a crime has been committed and this person's a suspect or this person could commit a crime that that's what they're looking for. And they don't have like the tools or resources necessary to be able to deal with people who are having some sort of mental health 
crisis where they have kind of cut off all their other support structures. Yeah, I, I think they should have like a some sort of social worker or psychologist go around with them and somebody has some tools or some related to do something. I don't know. It, you kind of run into a person's civil rights, right? But maybe somebody else could have, with it was trained as a psychologist, could have talked to her. Maybe she would have taken help. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Just... It's, it's really weird. And to me, the other thing that's kind of weird too is like these people like Dennis and Julian like called the police or not Julian didn't, but Julian was worried about her. Um, but they called the police to have them check on her. And then like, then they just left. Like that's, that's also something that for me, like if one of my friends is dealing with something or even when I was dealing with something and I would tell everybody like, no, leave me alone. They'd be like, okay, well, we don't have to talk, but like, I'm just going to hang out with you today to make sure that you're okay but like, we don't have to actually do anything. Like they would kind of force to like, even just be in the same area as me or as like, I do this with my friends too. Like when they're dealing with something and they don't even want to talk about it, like just being there for them physically, even if you're not talking, like that can make a real difference too. So I'm not saying that they did anything wrong. I just think that it's like, that's something else that a lot of people are really hesitant to do. And it's really interesting to see how that uh, shows up for people. Like, it's like, yeah, like you could be imposing on them. They might not be very happy with you that you're going to stay with them today, but like it could make a difference for them too. And there's so much making other people comfortable and what they're dealing with and just saying like, okay, I did my part and I'm going to leave them alone now. Like what, what could have happened if somebody had just like stayed there or if the police had just like kept talking to her, like, things like that, that could have changed the way that it went for Emma. Yeah. I think, like you said, people want, don't, they want to be nice, I guess. And, and Dennis, and I think in Dennis's case, he was, he didn't know her that well. I think they talked at the library about Japan for a few hours. And then he saw her at the Red British Blue Fish. They weren't super tight friends, but he remember obviously he, she, he, she made an impact on him because he remembered her. He remembers her as being cheerful and happy. And when he saw her that night, she was definitely not that. She was like afraid to walk through an area where they were doing some construction. You know, have though they have those like board, it's over the top, like little tunnels you see downtown. She didn't want to walk in there because she was afraid of it. And so I think when he saw the police arrive, he thought, okay, everything's cool. They're gonna he thought they were gonna take her in. But you know, like I said, they didn't have any mechanism. If she thought, if they thought she was suicidal, they could they could have brought her in because you know that's actually a crime. But yeah, Pe people don't want to intrude, mm -hmm. and it would have been nice if they did. I, I recall also recall another incident where some guy I thought actually saw her as late as midnight, still standing there, and he was like older and he didn't want to like he thought she'd be creeped out if he like tried to say something to her and so he didn't he just noticed that she was still there yeah which I, leads, oh, oh go ahead <laughs> i was just gonna say like i i was in a situation earlier two weeks ago uh for those who don't know uh I totaled my car and it was super late at night and uh, right next to the freeway and I'm fine. It wasn't a crazy accident. Just the car got messed up. Um, but I like waved down like a car that was a security vehicle that was an older gentleman and he got out and helped me. And like, I would be lying if I said that there weren't those thoughts of like, I like could have just put myself in an extremely dangerous situation. And like, he was incredibly nice and helpful and just was a genuinely good person. And like, I thought it was weird how I made that judgment so quickly. Like he pulled over to help me. And I was like, ready like on my guard the whole time 
And um, like, I also think about like what could have happened if I hadn't like actually asked someone to help me because I'm also a very independent person. Like I'd probably still be stuck on the side of the freeway with like nobody near me <laughs> because I'm a person, I, I will push that car wherever it needs to go by myself. <laughs> um, but yeah. And then like when he and I were talking, like people would pull over to ask if I was okay. And like he was closer to the car. So he would say like, oh yeah, like we're okay. And then he caught himself and he was like, no, I shouldn't be saying that. Like, you're the one who it is like, you should be talking to them. And so it's just like, there's, there's so many different like rules and expectations that like you, if you're an older man, you can't be nice to a younger lady because then it looks weird. Like there's, so many things like that where like you're on your guard about it and you get like all these things stuck up in your head about it. Or it's like, if that guy had been the person to talk to her, that could have made a difference. Like how differently would that have gone? And like, there's obviously instances where having those like quick snap judgments and things are really useful and they help keep you alive. But there are also times where like, I've seen people walking down the street that look like they're having a bad day and I don't say anything to them because I'm like, Oh, they've probably got the person, like they've got people around them to support them. And now I think about like how many more cases could that be where somebody just like vanishes because nobody had that, like was able to have that conversation with them because we're all like so stuck in what we're supposed to be doing instead of like out there possibly making a difference for them. Yep. Yeah. I, there's a, a lot of opportunities and it just kind of fell through the cracks. I, and I'm thinking another thing that came to mind when you're saying that is if she was still there at midnight, I remember Shelly at one point, I can't remember where it was saying she wanted to go out like that night because she came in, she went to the shelter and then she wanted to go like roam the streets and I think it was one of the police officers said, no, it's just, it's too dangerous. And so she didn't go out and she may have actually bumped into her. It's kind of like, you know, we both like football, right? That field goal that's missed in the first quarter doesn't seem like it means anything until you get to the fourth quarter. And that's the difference in the game. It's like, you see that throughout this whole day, you see that happening multiple times where if something just one little thing might've had gone the other way, the outcome might have been different. Yeah. That's part of the like speculation, right? About all these cases that are unsolved still. Like, uh, I think we talked about this last time with Maura Murray, where like the smallest detail in the case now, like years later, looks like it's the missing piece of the puzzle. Like everything is so much bigger and has so much more importance than it did when the case first happened, when it was like, Oh, this girl has just been missing for like a couple days. Like she was staying at a shelter. She's known to just wander around at night. Like she'll probably come back. And now eight and a half or yeah, almost eight and a half years later, here we are like still looking because of that initial like judgment about her. Yeah, and that actually kind of brings me into the next sort of topic. I was gonna talk about Patty who uh, was on the Fifth Estate, not, no, sorry, not the Fifth Estate, the um, nighttime podcast with Jordan Bonaparte. She was actually the one who chased Emma out of the shelter um, that night the night that she, dis she disappeared mm -hmm. and, and her take uh, is a lot different than uh, what we had heard on you know when the, the regular narrative is that Emma came to the shelter at six and found out her mom was coming and then freaked out and ran but if you listen to Patty who was there, she says that Emma didn't have a bed that night and that her and Emma were sitting on the steps to the attic 
where there was a lot of beds. And Patty was trying to get Emma a bed, like an emergency bed, because she could tell she was stressed. And somewhere in that conversation that Patty was having with the staff, Emma bolted. And Patty chased her out the door. And, and now I totally lost my train of thought where why, why this tied in, but I'll keep going now because I don't really have a choice. Um, <laughs> she, yeah, chased her out the door and was not able to catch up with her, which kind of throws on the original narrative on its ear, which was that um, Emma knew mom was coming or didn't know mom was coming. The other thing that Patty said, now, now I see where this ties in, is that she thanked the shelter for taking care of her, but she also thought some of the things that the shelter said about Emma weren't true. Like the shelter had said that she was taking like stuff from her room and putting it on the lawn across the road where the courthouse is because things were talking to her. Patty doesn't think any of that was actually true, that Emma never did that. And that tainted the police's view of her that the case was taken less seriously in the beginning because of that. So I don't know which one of those two is true, but you know, Patty was there. So yeah. So yeah, it is weird. Like uh I I was looking at the case on reddit a long or a while ago when we were talking about um this about emma's case when we first decided we were going to do this as our next episode and i can't find the exact post again but i'm pretty sure there was somebody who said that like they they either knew someone who went to that shelter or they had like called them to just like find out about getting a bed there or like they had lots of people have had interactions with the shelter that Emma went to. And a lot of them seemed like the shelter did not like people were not happy with them. Like they would uh, like, if you said that you were needing to stay there to stay away from your family or whatever, like the shelter would call your family to tell you to tell them that you were there, like things like that, that were just kind of like off about them. Um, and that the people who like, uh, would, you would expect to be working at a place like that, like usually very warm and welcoming and friendly, like from first interactions, they were like cold and reserved and not at all like that sense of comfort. Like it was all about, um, just getting people in and out as quick as possible instead of actually taking care of them. Um, and I wish that I had the original post about it but it is probably pretty far down here um yeah i i just found that one post to be pretty interesting and then with patty's story about how like it's so different than what the shelter says and like you just said like how differently the police may have treated the case if they had looked at Emma as like this young girl who was struggling with something and needed support in her life instead of this like young homeless person who was going crazy. Yeah, I don't, I like to think that the shelter did their best to take care of her. I, I think they do. I, I don't know if they're, they're getting the same thing that the people around Morris crashed site deal with is just all these people calling so they're kind of famous now because they you know because of emma i don't know if that affects the way they respond to people i also kind of find that odd that somebody would say they would call their parents because they you know shelly was saying they eventually would kick her out they told shelly not to show up anymore because they're supposed to keep some of that stuff secret. Like a lot of these women come from abused relationships and they don't want like their abuser to find out they're there. Mm -hmm. so I kind of find that odd that they would call somebody. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. And again, like I haven't had any personal experience with the shelter, so I have no idea if that's true or not, but it was just something that I found and wanted to bring up as, a possible thing to talk about in like 
coincidence with what Patty was saying about um, them talking about her putting her stuff outside and all of that. The other thing that Patty said that was interesting is she didn't think of Emma as having schizophrenia or she thought she was really de dealing with somebody who was stalking her. And I kind of got the impression that Patty might think that someone having mental illness is kind of a stigma. Some people kind of is in some countries. I mean, even still here in the U.S., there's some people that think, oh, you're crazy, right? And, and it's not like, you know, you tell somebody who's got cancer that they're crazy. You know, they're just sick, right? So I don't know if that, any of that plays into it. But Patty really insists that Emma was a bit of a free spirit, but she wasn't, you know, dealing with severe mental illness. At least that's what she thinks. She thinks she was actually being stalked. And she actually does call out somebody who we're going to talk about in a minute here. Yeah. Probably yeah. Guess, probably guess who that is. I might have some idea. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I like in looking at the case and in like just thinking about how I would handle the situation if I was like a young person. Well, I am a young person. If I was a, like being stalked by someone <laughs> um, like how scary that would be like how terrifying it would be to be being stalked by someone even if like if Emma was dealing with depression or something like that like being so isolated from people in her life in those last couple of weeks and then you add in this like outside stressor fa uh, factor and that could be even more like if she thought that they were dangerous or something. And that's part of why she started pulling away from friends and stuff like that, like trying to protect them or like whatever there was there for her. And like being such a care, like, I don't want to say carefree, but like a, such an independent, like creative person, um, like that would have like a devastating impact on someone, I think. And like our, we were talking about how she used to like spread the leaves that people would rake up and say it was good for nature. And it's like, yeah, that's composting. Like you are exactly right. That is so true. And going from someone who's so loving like that and nurturing to having this like possibly dangerous person in her life, whether or not she knew them before, but just having that kind of like thought in your head all the time, you'd want to protect the people you care about. Like it would be a great stressor on you and on your mind to be like conscious that like at any time you could be being watched, like things like that, that could make anyone feel a little bit crazy. Yeah. And that's what Patty thinks. She, Emma never directly says who it is. You know, they don't know if that was the person from Campbell River. It was somebody else. Patty does call out um, Julian Hua right at the end of the interview with what he did with she did with Jordan, um, telling me he'd be such a bigger person that he would just come clean. But I don't I don't know what to think about Julian. I, I guess first off, maybe I should explain who Julian is if people don't know. So Julian met Emma in Perth which like I said before was way over on the East coast and he was going to school and they had kind of a friendship kind of pseudo romantic relationship that didn't last too long, maybe a month or so. And then she moved to Victoria. When he finished school, he ends up in Victoria also, which he claims was a complete you know, it was completely by chance. It was completely random. He chose that because he could bike all year wrong and there was a good bus system and he had a job, you know, somebody, he knew somebody there that was going to give him a job. So, so he claims it was completely random. I don't know if that's true. I think maybe he followed her there. I don't know. Or subconsciously he knew he was go she was going there. But so Patty calls him out, but then you see him, you know, he kind of gets vilified in the Fifth Estate episode. 
to make him look like the villain. But when he was on the podcast with Jordan, he like right at the end, you could tell that he's really sad about her being missing. And that the day that she went missing, he he actually saw her twice. He got off the bus to get his medical card. He thought he saw her from the back, then he but he went in and got his car. When he came out, she was still there. So he goes into the street, looks in the face, and it's Emma. And he asks her if she needs help. And then, you know, I think he maybe he still had some sort of thought there could be something there with her. But this, I think, kind of ended it when she said, no, you know, I don't need help. And so he, I, I kind of get the impression he just kind of was mad at her and kind of walked off. So when you hear him in the Fifth Estate, he's kind of like, or not the Fifth Estate, the nighttime podcast, he seems very, very sad that he didn't help. I mean, the last minute of it, you can really tell he's sad. And I don't know. So I don't know what to think about him. He, a lot of people think he's involved. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of crazier coincidences than that happening, right? Like, especially in high school. I remember thinking about all the people that were going to different like colleges all around and somebody would pick some like random college in the middle of Virginia. And then they would be like, Oh yeah, this is where I'm moving to. And you'd hear somebody else in the back of the class be like, Oh, I'm going there too. And they're like, well, like this college has like 300 students going to it. Like, what are the chances that we both end up going there? And it's interesting because it, like, it could be a total coincidence. It could be just that he like subconsciously was going there after her. Um, but yeah. And like uh, we were talking about earlier her, well, I say that, but when we were off camera talking about the case earlier, <laughs> we were talking about him and about how sad he is that she's missing. And I feel like if, if you, if he had something to do with it, like to the level that people speculate that he did, then he would have to be like a master manipulator of people to have that kind of like emotion and that much sadness tied into the case. Um, if there wasn't any like guilt or anything like that mixed in with it. But if it's just like him being sad, like we were talking about it being that he like is upset that she's gone. Like a lot of people are. And now like you think about this guy that like had a friendship, had a connection with her, happened to move to the same place and saw her on the street as a friend wanted to say hi and now he's like the main bad guy in the story. Like that would be really difficult for him too. While dealing with that someone that he really cares about is still missing. So I can yeah. kind of see both sides like that. Yeah. I kind of see, I have the same opinion of him. I think, I don't think he was involved. I think given just I'm really basing it on the last couple of minutes of that interview, I think he's actually generally sad that she's gone. And so I don't think he was involved. Of course, nobody knows, right? What happened? We don't even know what happened to her, but he's, that's the way he seems to me. And he kind of has gotten, you know, trashed in the public opinion poll. Like he's probably, you know, he's kind of withdrawn from, you know, social media and things trying to like basically hide. So that, yeah, I got, that's kind of my opinion of him too, that he's kind of a, almost another victim of her being missing. Yeah. And then like, of course he's not helping himself in the like withdrawing from the public and becoming so private. Cause now that's like a justification for a lot of people, right. That he's uh, that he's guilty. Cause now he's withdrawn. It's like, well, like I live down the street from people that I went to high school with. And if they end up getting going missing, if something happens to them, then now I could be a suspect because I live so close to them. Like just because those connections are made after the fact and like sometimes months or years later that at first like had no connection, but now like we were talking about earlier, like the littlest detail has so much more like meaning added to it. 
to turn it into something else. Yeah. Patty sure seems to think that he was involved, but I, yeah, I, of course I don't know, but I doubt it. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of Julian in a nutshell. And he, yeah, he's pretty much pulled back for good reason, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do think that there's some stock, <laughs> pardon the pun, in uh, Emma being stalked or having someone kind of following or watching her. Because I, I could also get that from like that day where we were talking about like two people have called the police on this girl. So she's had to like defend herself kind of two police officers twice or like in a day. Like that kind of stress to feel like somebody's watching me, somebody might be out for me because the police keep talking to me about how I'm doing and what's going on. Like people think that I'm going insane right now. That would be insane for someone to have to deal with. I think, yeah, the first time they don't think they followed up, but somebody did call seeing her like shuffling across the street, just really looking really, really sad. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see like a, not like a, well, kind of like a transcript or kind of like what happened after that initial call, if there wasn't like follow up with her. And then when they checked on her the second time, if they mentioned that first call and were like, hey, we got a call about this lady and we think it might have been you. So now there's two people that have called the police being concerned about you, like, what what's going on like that just immediately would put you on edge for like okay like people are watching me like they keep calling the police on me and I'm just sad and trying to deal with what's happening in my life right now yeah Emma or not Emma Shelley has actually tried to get that transcript or whatever notes I don't know if they I'm sure they didn't transcribe word for word but they won't release it because it's still an active case. It's it's kind of like ongoing and active, as they say, which means that they want to keep their information close to hand in case they don't want, in case they take somebody to court and they say something, they don't want them to say, oh, I heard that in the news or whatever, or some podcast. It's information that was only, you know, only the perpetrator or whatever, if there was one we don't know that would have because they were involved. So she can't get the transcript or whatever notes that they have because she wanted to see it. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know. All we know is multiple people, you know, there's even more that didn't call the police that, that, you know, Shelly met later that had noticed her that day, which is kind of odd because after that, right, the 29th, we might have William who picked her up and she was, supposedly just screaming to no one in the middle, you know, in the middle of the night. After that, you don't see her and she's not the kind of person that just disappears. I mean, people notice her for some reason. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another thing that could point to more like malicious or foul intended things to me, like the fact Uh, the way that you phrase that just like popped that into my head is like, she's a noticeable person. So either somebody would have seen something or someone with the wrong intentions could have seen someone who was like upset and sad and hurting and taken advantage of that for whatever they had planned for her. And because of so many people throughout the day, like checking on her to make sure she was okay. Um, even though she was so independent, like having someone who asked her, like, how's it going? How are you doing? And her brushing them off, like that would, or if she accepted help from them too, like that could have put her in a really dangerous situation. And I don't like to think about it that way. I don't like to think about any of the missing persons cases that way, because my hope is always that they're found alive and safe and happy and healthy and have been like living on a farm, growing carrots with a whole bunch of dogs, like love and life. But like the harsh reality of the situation is that someone in a more vulnerable mental state 
with such a like big presence that has so many people drawn to her that notice her uh, just leaves her open to me or it leaves her open more to those like mal intended people, at least from like looking back and thinking about it. Yep. I mean, even Shelly mentioned, might've been on Jordan Bone parts. The comment she made is it's midnight. The truck pulls over. There's this woman, right. It's sort of, paints this sort of terrifying picture of her walking along the road and there's a truck pulls up. Like you said, you don't, it, it lead, does definitely leads you to being more vulnerable to that kind of thing when you're in that not probably not great mental state. And like you said, she just seems to stick out in a way that people notice her even, even before she had that day, people noticed her first, you know, you're just one of those people people noticed. So yeah, you're completely on right on with that. Yeah. That makes oh, oh go ahead. I just hope that's not what happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's I hope that that's not what happened too. Let's I just like yeah, I think about I tend to be someone that people notice, believe it or not, Bob. Uh the the multicolored hair that half that changes every couple weeks and just like always tending to be the loudest person in the room, whether I try or not to be <laughs> um, like, there have been some weird like things that have happened in my life where like people will come up to me and start talking to me about something. Cause I look like an approachable person or like I'm a colorful person. And yes, if it weren't for, <laughs> If it weren't for me being like kind of on edge all the time about people because of cases and things like this that I've read and like learned so much about being a, a true crime junkie, uh, I, I definitely could have gotten myself into more dangerous situations. And like, if I was more trusting of people that it could have gone very poorly for me. I mean, when I was a child in elementary school, I was like, I want to be independent. So I packed up a suitcase and tried to run away from home when I was in like second grade, because I was like, I can do this by myself. Thanks parents. But I got this. I quickly learned that I did not got this and returned home within the hour. Uh, but like things like that, we're looking back on it. I'm like if one person had come up to me and been like, do you need a ride somewhere? I'd be like, yeah, like take me somewhere else. And like, then I'm in their control of whatever they want to do. And with Emma, like running away from the shelter and feeling like she was being stalked, I could see that like helpful uh, offer from a stranger, right. Of like a place to stay or a ride somewhere, something to get her away from that situation that she may or may not have been in. Like that could have been such a great option for her that then somebody did whatever they did, or maybe they just took her somewhere and dropped her off and she's amazing at hiding and doesn't want to be found. Yep. That's the thing about her. I think when we talked about Mora, there was that lady they had on that, that was the expert in dis people that disappear. And she said they either have a ton of resources or none. I think Emma was in the latter case, but she actually, Emma seems like a person that could actually pull it off. She's kind of scrappy and, and, and independent and resourceful. Mm -hmm. I, I think she could, she could actually pull it off. And, and she seems to be able to live like next to, with next to nothing a lot of the times. So I could see that she could pull it off. Oh, but I still, I do find it kind of odd that, she also doesn't seem like the kind of person that would let her mom suffer so much. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to find the, um, the thing that I was just looking at in on Reddit. Um, for those of you who are watching, I have another monitor up here. I'm not just staring off into nothingness. <laughs> um, I, I do stare off into nothingness. <laughs> uh, where did it go? 
do, 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 do. Somebody was talking about how somebody who looked like, maybe looked like Emma, had walked up to a missing persons poster and like ripped it down and said that they didn't want to be found. Like as it was one a poster of Emma, but nobody's like has confirmed or not confirmed if that was actually her. But I was trying to find what day it was that that happened or when that happened, if it was more recent or. It was, uh, I recall that one being earlier. And that would have been in Van Vancouver, the city of Vancouver, not the island. Um, There's a lot of reports that she was there and somebody said that they saw her tearing down one of her own posters. Mm -hmm. There's also, uh, I guess we didn't talk about the green shirt guy, the so-called green shirt guy. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he pulled into a clothing store in Vancouver, had a crumpled up pic- poster of Emma, a missing poster in his hand and said, she's my girlfriend and she doesn't want to be found because she hates her parents. And then he made some comment about some piece of clothing that this is, oh, Emma could fit into this. She's really petite. And then he walked out and there wasn't Vancouver PD's play case. So they, sh- I think they took a while to get to the store. So they never did actually find the guy, whoever he was. And people are like, is he a crackpot? Did he, is he just making things up? Or does he actually know Emma? Yeah. I just pulled up the picture or like the CCTV footage of him. Um, I do think it's really weird. I always get nervous about things like that. Like this, when they happen, when somebody like claims to know the person or claims to be involved in some way, because like either it's true and they actually know something and they're just not being helpful and like telling anybody where she is or they don't know anything and they just want to be a part of the public spotlight for a bit and get some fame or credit from the case, which I think is like disgusting as a person to do that too. Like not only to the person who's actually missing and taking away from that, but taking away from their family and like police resources to be investigating something that's not actually true. Yep. Another one where nobody knows. Yeah. Which of those two it is. It's a crackpot just wanted to insert himself into the case or if he actually does know where she is. Yeah. Well, that's uh, one of the things that people were talking about on Reddit uh, is if like these pictures of him or pictures of Emma are still being posted around Canada and around other places. Cause like, Uh, or well I started thinking about that and about how many missing persons cases are so huge in the news for like two maybe three days and then there's nothing about them again until they're found or until there's a break in the case like there is nothing and so like I would be interested to know how many like if there was a place whether it was with a news channel or if somebody in news networking watches this and would be willing to talk about like some sort of segment or something where they could show pictures and of like suspects or missing people like on a more daily basis. Um, Because I know like if I saw the green shirt guy or if I saw like Emma's picture every day or uh, Maura Murray's picture every day, um, like then it would be something that people could actually look out for. Whereas like you don't know about these cases unless you're actually like a true crime investigator, part of the police force or part of their family, or if you're a true crime fan, I should say. Um, But it's like those groups of people, only people who are actively looking into the cases would actually get to see what these people look like. 
And that's like heartbreaking to me because there are so many people that could see someone like could see Emma, could see the green shirt guy, could see a Mora and just be like, oh yeah, I saw them. But because they don't know that they're missing, they haven't seen what they look like, then there's no real opportunity for those kinds of connections to be made. Yep. I think this case has still got some press, but like you said, most of it's in the first month, first couple of days and it tapers off to a month and then slowly, unless there's some, like you said, some lead. I think Shelly's done a good, as good a job as anybody can do keeping it active. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, I think the last big update was probably Williams, when William came forward in 2018, mentioning that he had thought he picked her up that night. It's sort of odd that he waited so long. Um, I don't know what's with that, but, and then they brought those cadaver dogs out. Kim Cooper um, brought her dogs out to Van or Victoria and they searched the area from there to Colwood. So Colwood is where they found her, the uh, guy, I think his name was Dennis. I don't have that right. Found her prepaid visa card. And that's where she told William she was heading was Callwood to meet a friend. Of course, they never identify that friend, but yeah, there's, there hasn't been a lot since 2018, really. Yeah. Maybe, they, yeah, they should do a segment on the news every night or something. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Like some, something on the news, like, even if it's in the middle or at the end, like a, almost like a slideshow of like, these people are missing, or even if they just did it area by area, like these people are missing. And like, if you see them, call us and let us know, um, or call the police and let them know, <laughs> not, you don't need to call the news, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like, something like that, right? Because then you would see these faces, you would know the who these people are, and it would drum up a lot more interest in the cases so that, like, there have been lots of armchair detectives and, like, cases that a group of people on the internet will start looking into, and some of them have been solved because they get people together. It's like, what if we had that where some, like a picture with a name was there and then you could go in and do your own research about it. I saw uh, um, something that actually it's kind of a joke, but I think it would be awesome. So they're talking about quarantine and COVID this past year and all the true crime fans, they were like, they should have just mailed us cold cases. Then we could have spent this last year just investigating them. And you would have had like hundreds of thousands of cases that could have been solved because you can use the community that's available to you to like help search instead of it just being the police and people in their family and true crime fans um, investigating it. I don't, you're probably too young to remember this because they, they don't do this anymore, but they used to have them on milk cartons. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it, but I know it was a thing. Yeah, I don't, even when, when I was a kid and probably even to when I was in high school, it used to be, and I don't know, I can't even remember if it was specific milk, but it was like, have you seen me? And those would be just obviously be distributed all over the place, right? Yeah. And they, they would be on one shipment or whatever. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Starbucks. Yeah. Starbucks Corporation. Put I work for you. Put them <laughs> on every coffee cup. <laughs> so I guess that um, my bumped my camera. That's not working so good. I have a new camera set up. So <laughs> above my desk, I can see that it shakes. So it's probably going to show up in the video. So I'll have to modify it again for the next next time. Um, I guess that leads us to theories. I think we've covered. I mean, I was kind of like the Mora case. There's a lot of details, but I think we covered the major stuff. Theories, what happened to her? Where is she? I think she either met someone 
this is a lot like the Mora case. She either met someone that took her far away from that area. So by the time it became like a national case, she had moved somewhere else. Like maybe she made it to the U.S. Maybe she went somewhere else. Like either she got far away from there and that's why they weren't able to pick up on any clues for her or she met someone with malintentions and is no longer alive. I feel like that's really like she disappeared and was really good at it. And I feel like that's something that is definitely a possibility. Like it's not out of, there's nothing really off the table, but um, I feel like her just disappearing and like setting herself up to start a new life somewhere is possible. And I also feel like her, like calling her mom to reach out for help and then telling her mom not to come. Like she clearly had some sort of relationship with her mom where she knew that she could reach out to her for support. And like, if she was still alive, she would be, she would have done that already, like called Shelly to ask her for something or to tell her that she was okay. Because you can see and like hear how much Shelly's heart is breaking and has been broken over the past eight and a half years without her daughter. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, I have this kind of nutty theory. All right, Bob, here we go. It also plays into her being gone, which I, like you said, I can't, she doesn't seem like the kind of person that would leave her mom hanging like that. Um, so here's, I, I, I don't know, it came out this when I was on San Juan Island. So Vancouver Island and San Juan are about five miles apart. And in good weather, I could see if you could get from Victoria, from the Inner Harbor, and, and that's why that one sighting her is so odd on the 5th, when the lady says that she helped her frame a shot. Remember, uh, Emma was a trained photojournalist. Mm -hmm. not all those little details if you could get on a boat and get to san juan i know you can come in in a bunch of those bays especially at night like by the ruben tart picnic area the bays are really nicely sheltered because i dove most of the bays on an island back when i used to be a diver you could walk ashore and i could swear because I, I used to, we used to ride our bike over on the ferry they don't check your ID when you come back on. They assume that you came by ferry. They don't check your ticket unless you have a reservation for the trip out. If you walk on, you can just walk on. Mm -hmm. And then she would be in the States. You land, you land in Anacortes and then you're in the United States. Of course, after that, she doesn't have her passport. She's got to somehow find a job and get some sort of new ID. But Chris McCandless did it. He, he changed yeah. his name and and he was able to get a job. I think it was in, was it in Iowa, like working on a farm. I mean, I could see that, but then I flip back and think, would she let her mom just hang out there? I don't, I just don't know unless she's got amnesia or something or is afraid now to come back because she's been gone so long and she's afraid they'll really be mad at her. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another thing, like another little interesting thing to add to the puzzle, right? Like if, if she has been gone for this long, hasn't made any contact with her mom, like if she left initially because she was scared of someone stalking her and she wanted to wait till she thought it was safe and that like two weeks of getting comfortable turned into six months of getting comfortable wherever she is now, like, and it just like kept snowballing till now it feels wrong to reach out to her um, or that she uh, ended up having some sort of like schizophrenia or, or some sort of something like that that affected her brain that now she like doesn't know exactly who she is like something like that where some some Jane Doe somewhere in uh, uh, like care facility is Emma, but because nobody sees her picture, because nobody knows about the case, there's nobody checking those people to see if she made it somewhere else. Yep. I guess the other theory is I'm kind of with you. 
somebody may have picked her up, somebody with malintention. There's other people think that she was trafficked. I think that's a friend of mine's theory. Although police kind of ruled that out because they usually when someone's trafficked, they're generally really young. And two, there's like a grooming period where they meet somebody and they're really nice to them. And they say, oh, let's take a trip. And then they get in, then they're like taken away from their family. And that didn't seem to happen, but you don't know. They could have just saw her and saw the opportunity and then shipped her to, I don't know, somewhere, another country. Um, some people think that. Was she kidnapped? She's being kept, held against her will even still. I mean, you see that occasionally too, right? Mm-hmm. Being somebody's, what was that guy? They, they were in there as attic for like a decade or something. I can't remember that, the name of that case. Um, of course, we just covered still alive and hiding. I don't know about my theory. I don't know how well they patrol that border in the water like they have radar and the second you cross over you know they patrol boats are out there i don't know i don't know how that works how free that channel is between victoria and san juan i know in a calm day you could easily get across there and and i could see you sneaking on shore and then walk into the ferry yeah bam you're in the u.s but I don't know. I have some friends who live in the San Juan Islands, so maybe I'll reach out to them. And one of my good friends who is actually from Canada, her parents lived in the San Juans and they would go back and forth a lot. So I could ask her too, if they know any more about that, like living out there or seeing more instances of that happening. But it is interesting because like the physical border is so well patrolled and kind of kept uh in check that like that would that could be an open spot and then uh i'd like to do some more research into what are her options if she comes here without a passport without anything like that from canada like what would she need to be set up and where could she go what could she do to like live a successful life here or wherever she ended up yeah, I mean, you see the reverse from the other border, right? People come across and get and live here and work and they don't have passports. So I don't, yeah, I think that part is possible. I don't know if they've got like sensors, they got sonar in the water. I don't know how it's patrolled. I don't know how easy, because usually people that like aren't up to something like trying to sneak away, just go into customs. Mm-hmm. Like when you come from, you take the, the Clipper to Vancouver you know, you go to Canadian customs, you come back, you go through U.S. customs, but you're not trying to sneak in, right? I don't know how well it's patrolled. It'd be interesting to know. Maybe well, maybe- Bob, you know what we got to do? We got to do some research. No, we just got to go try it, see how far we get. <laughs> <laughs> At night, we're rowing across. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, yeah, those are the major theor- theories. There hasn't really been any new updates, really not many new clues for a while. Mm -hmm. As my project manager friend says, you need a plan or a plan to get a plan. And right now we don't even have a plan to get a plan. What what new leads are going to come up? It's going to come up to somebody saying something that they saw or somebody sees Emma and knows who she is and Yeah, I guess that's the other thing that, like, I just want to put out there, even though I'm sure lots of people have said it before, is, like, if Emma's still out there, it's not too late. If you saw something eight years ago that you weren't sure about, but you've never talked about it, like, it is never too late to come forward and say something. Uh, It it would be better to just investigate it and get it off your chest instead of living with that not having said something because it could be the key to the case even if you just saw her at a 7-eleven like there you never know what could what that could bring about for like new investigations and new leads yep that's what they need that might be the puzzle piece the piece is there somewhere just we don't know what it is and nobody's come forward in a while Like I said, 2018 was the last thing. And before that, there was nothing for six years, really. 
between 2012 and 2018. Yeah. So I think that's it, unless you have something else to say. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's about it. I I just like this is one of those cases, like with most of the cases that we've talked about off camera and on camera. Uh, Bob and I are the kind of people that will get done recording this, then we'll just go sit in the kitchen and talk for another hour or two about different cases we want to talk about here. Um, I just like am always hopeful that they'll be found. And I know this is, yeah, like they, it'll just stick in my head. Like Emma Philippoff, like that name comes into my head all the time. And sometimes I'm like, what, what, am, what, why am I thinking about that right now? But then it's that like, if, if I'm not thinking about it, if I'm not looking into it, then who is like, let's, let's take that on, even though there is like Shelly and the whole team of people looking for her. Like, it's always better to have more eyes and more ears and more people sharing about it than just keep trying to do it by yourself. Yep. I think about him a lot too, especially because I know somebody that knows Shelly. Um, also hoping, hopefully Kimberly, Kimberly Bordage is kind of Shelly's like right hand person. She was working on a film call. Um, Good luck, every heart, which is a quote from Emma. Uh, I think COVID kind of shut that down. Hopefully she'll finish that, trying to bring more to the case. Anyway, all right, I guess we're going to sign off. Hopefully my camera didn't shake too much. I think that's another thing, I, the next thing I get to fix because this desk is kind of wobbly. All right, take care. Um, thank you for watching and help us out by subscribing and sharing. Bye. All right.